Week two of the NFL sees a matchup between the Denver Broncos and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And really the story of this game is two young offenses with question marks all across the board. How might that impact the outcome of this game? Chris Carter, myself, we'll break it down here on today's Crossover Thursday episode on the Locked On Podcast Network. You are Locked On NFL Crossover, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's happening, everyone? Welcome to another Crossover Thursday episode here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Crossover Thursday is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL to win $50 instantly when you play $5. I'm Cody Rourke, host of the Locked On Broncos podcast, joined alongside by Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. Week two is officially here, and the story for both these teams has a little bit something to do with young offenses and maybe some of the growing pains that come with that. How will the Broncos and the Steelers, respectively, put themselves in a position to win this game on Sunday, and what are the biggest storylines? You get all of that here on this Crossover Thursday episode. Chris, my friend, it's great to catch up with you here. I know we've caught up a little bit in the offseason from time to time, especially when the news broke that Russell Wilson was landing with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, Here we are week two of the regular season. You're really kind of opening things up on the Pittsburgh Steelers side of things. A lot of people in the pre-schedule making process said, hey, Steelers, Broncos, okay, when when that might that Russell Wilson revenge game potentially happen? Well, here we are entering week two. All signs point according to Mike Tomlin. That's not going to be the case. You got Justin Fields potentially there at quarterback with this young Steelers offense. Tell us, what is the biggest storyline here for the Steelers offense this week? I think the biggest storyline has to be that we might get our first look at like the youngest version of the Steelers offense. And that's saying something because it's pretty doggone young. Uh, they had two guys starting on the offensive line last week, making their first start in the NFL. They might have they, they might have a third this week in Troy Faltano, and that's because on top of Russell Wilson's injury concerns, he has a calf injury. For those in Bronco Land who might be unfamiliar, he injured his calf in the conditioning test the Steelers did. Uh, you know, it was at the start of training camp, he did not practice for most of training camp. Said he could have practiced if they would, but they were being cautious with everything. And then he came back in, looked fine in the third preseason game. Uh, but then the first week, the first week of practice for the for game for the game against the Falcons, uh, he you know pulls himself out. He gets looked at. Mike Tomlin says he's limited, and then Justin Fields ends up starting. And then we, you know, we're sort of like, okay, well, maybe he maybe he just needs a couple days or, or something. Well. Uh, Mike Tomlin came out in his Tuesday press conference and said the Steelers will be preparing for week two as if Justin Fields will be the starter. And he's leaving the light on. That's a Tomlinism. He always will leave the light on for this guy. They're leaving the light on for Russell Wilson to make his return if he can. Uh, Russell Wilson officially on the injury report limited on Wednesday. That's a good sign that he's not completely out of it, but it's really going to be determined by how he it, it, can he get to full either Thursday or Friday. And Mike Tomlin did indicate that. He that there are certain guys that get exceptions for needing to be in full practice on Friday. Young guys, they need to be in full practice. But guys like Russell Wilson that have been around the NFL that can ramp up and be, and, and be ready for the game, they might be given an exception. So this might still be a game day question going into Sunday when these two teams clash. But on top of that is the question as far as Dan Moore Jr., the starting left tackle for the Steelers. They've been trying to replace him because the last two drafts, they picked first round offensive tackle Broderick Jones in 2023, Troy Fautano in 2024. And there's a lot of excitement around these guys. But while these guys are young players figuring it out in the NFL, Dan Moore Jr. had a heck of a preseason, looked very good. And then in week one, he was one of the best uh, pass blocking linemen in the NFL. Didn't give up a single pressure, was lined up with Judon here and there. Did a very good job, but he now has an ankle injury, and now he is he was he did not practice on Wednesday. Now we need to see what happens Thursday and Friday because I think he's all another one of those guys that could ramp up very quickly. But this meant we saw Broderick Jones. He's been playing at right tackle since he came in since he started starting last year, but his natural position is left tackle. Now he's practicing at left tackle, Troy Faltanu at right tackle, where they envision him for the future. This could be the closest look that we have seen to the Steelers and the future of this offense that they actually want to take shape. They've got Zach Frazier already starting at center. He was their second-round pick this year. He had a really good, I mean, a fantastic week one as far as expectations go. Uh, But now you may have 
those those three guys, uh, first and second round picks, and Spencer Anderson, a second year seventh round pick, starting at left guard. This could be a st- extremely young offensive line with a with a with Justin Fields, the guy who's the younger of the two quarterbacks you brought in this year, all with a receiving core that's basically led by George Pickens, uh, who is on his. Uh, third year in the NFL, lots of youth that's going to be seen on the offensive side of the ball, Cody. Well, I, you know, youth it brings a lot of growing pains. It also brings opportunities for excitement. I know, obviously, with Arthur Smith there now calling plays for the offense, it, the vibe feels a little bit different for the Steelers, at least from an outside perspective when watching them, is that, hey, this isn't the uh, the Matt Canada Steelers offense in a sense. Like, you know, you do have some dynamic young pieces. And, and look, obviously, Najee Harris, a big physical back. Jalen Warren, in my opinion, is the one guy – I look at that gives me a little more concern because he's a little bit of a hybrid guy. He, he can burst mm-hmm. off with explosiveness. And then obviously Pat Fryermuth at the tight end position. So when you factor in a guy like Justin Fields, if he is in fact going to be the starter here on Sunday against the Broncos, Denver struggled against him last season when he was a member of the Chicago Bears. Uh, luckily, they were able to find a way to come back and win that game. Russell Wilson helped lead that effort, ironically enough, as we look at the storylines that kind of combined. But uh, definitely something worth monitoring here going forward. Now I got to ask you too, I, I watched the game against the Falcons because that was the game that was on before Denver. Mm. What TJ Watt looked like a man on a mission looked like, you know, he was mad. He didn't get defensive player of the year last year. He certainly looked like he came and said, Hey, that's my award this year. I'm going to take it. What's the story with the Steelers defense this week? I've said for a while, I think this defense has the potential to be elite and maybe even the best in the NFL, particularly because one TJ Watt is back healthy and he is, is a man on a mission. He it's funny when he won the 2021 NFL Defensive Player of the Year. He was furious that he didn't get it the year before when he was fantastic that year as well. Then in 2020, he just tore everything down. Now 2022, he got injured, missed half the season, so he was. It was like I think he was. He was like, "Oh, that's reasonable." You know, of course, he, he didn't have his best year that year because he was hurt. Uh, but in 2023, when he led the NFL in sacks again. Uh, I think that was his fourth time of his career leading the NFL in sacks. And I think that he's like the only guy in NFL history to lead it four out of five seasons or something like that. Um, when he didn't get that, then he was like, okay, fine. Excuse me, th- three out of the last four seasons, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in, in that rate. But he's like, okay, fine. I'll do it myself. And he's and he came out, and it's funny. He, he only, if you look at the stat sheet, he only had one sack, but he had one sack taken away because they thought he was offsides. Video evidence showed that he wasn't, and they didn't go to the booth to to just to take it away. But it would have been his a second sack with a fumble that he that he forced and recovered himself, and it would have wiped away that the Falcons only touchdown. And again, that's just T.J. Watt. Alex Highsmith is still a problem on the Steelers defensive front. Kim Hayward was hurt last year, and he couldn't play. This year, he's healthy, and he looks like he's a problem. Larry Ogunjobi's healthy. Keanu Benton has been fantastic. Fantastic on the defensive line. Second year guy out of Wisconsin, uh, second round pick last year. Joey Porter Jr. has been very sharp. Dante Jackson doesn't even have to be a starter. He doesn't have to be a number one guy. He can just be a good role playing second corner. Mick Fitzpatrick's still at still the all pro level. You got Patrick Queen in this defense. They are just layered with depth upon depth upon depth. There's not a role, the one role playing position where you think like, okay, maybe if I can circle this guy and pick on him, it's the slot corner, Beanie Bishop, the undrafted guy out of West Virginia. But even Beanie has a little bit of testiness to himself and they have ways to kind of cover him up and protect him from being overexposed. This Steelers defense, it is for real this year. Barring they get decimated by injuries like they did last year. They were down to like their sixth and seventh linebackers. Their sixth and seventh. Say Patrick Peterson had to play safety at the end of the season because they were just decimated with injuries last year. If they can avoid that kind of stuff t- throughout the season, this I, I don't see a reason why this defense isn't top five, and I wouldn't be shocked if it's top three or even the best. I, I wouldn't be surprised either. And look, I always say the formula in today's NFL, if you can find a way to make it happen, if you have an elite level player at every level of the field defensively, we're talking about the line, whether that's your pass rusher, interior, linebacker in the secondary, it certainly makes everybody's job around you a lot easier. It makes the defensive coordinator kind of sit back and say, hey, all right, let's unleash him. And look, that's going to be, I think, a challenge here for the Broncos this upcoming week. And as we continue our crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network, brought to you by our friends over there at Price Picks. A lot to dive into with this matchup. You've heard the Steelers' perspective of it. Chris is going to flip the script here, and he's going to get insight here on what's going on with the Denver Broncos this week as Bo Nix prepares for his home opener in front of everyone in Broncos country. Broncos country. Today's episode of the show is brought to you by our friends over there at DoorDash. And football season is now in full effect, so you know what that means. You may not always have time to sit there and make your game day favorites from the comfort of your own home. Sometimes 
you're stressed, you're waiting for kickoff to get here, you are anxious about the big game, well, DoorDash makes it easier to get your local favorites and your national chain favorites delivered directly to your doorstep. And personally, on game day, my three favorite items, you can never go wrong with burgers, you can never go wrong with wings, especially wings, honey barbecue to be exact, or even fries. And you know what? Pizza is also a great option as well. Whether it's your local mom and pop shop down the road or it's a national chain favor that you really enjoy, get it delivered directly to your doorstep today with DoorDash. Use promo code LOCKEDFALL24 for 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order. Limited time offer terms apply. Promo is not valid for orders containing alcohol. DoorDash, your door to game day greatness, your door to more. Download the DoorDash app now to order your game day favorites. Must be 21 or older to order alcohol. Drink responsibly. Alcohol available only in select markets. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends over there at Hims. And man, when you leave the house, it's the phone, wallet, or keys. How's my hair look? But if you're experiencing hair loss, you may not be so confident when you step outside the door. It's time to get that confidence back and restore your hair with Hims. Hims offers a variety of different treatment options, whether it's topical, whether it's taking a pill. They give you things that can help you restore confidence, not only to restore your hair, but also for things like ED as well. Hims provides access to a range of hair loss treatments that work all from the comfort of your home. Hims makes treating hair loss simple with doctor trusted treatment options and clinically proven ingredients like finasteride or minoxidil that can regrow hair in as little as three to six months. And they offer personalized chewable oral spray and serum treatment options that you can find what works best for you. Hims has hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers. So if you feel like you're losing a part of yourself with your hair loss, get Hims and get your confidence back. Start your free online visit today at hims.com slash locked on NFL. That's H I M S dot com slash locked on NFL for your personalized hair loss treatment options. Hibs.com slash locked on NFL. Results vary based on studies of top and oral minoxidil prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. We're back here on Crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Chris Carter of Locked On Steelers here with Cody Rourke of Locked On Broncos. Cody, let's talk about Denver. Bo Nix comes in, didn't get the dub, but impressed. And impressed Mike Tomlin. I will say that. He, he, was, he, he was talking about that touchdown run he had. He was like, oh, we saw that. We're ready, we're ready, we're ready for that. We're, we, we want to prepare for that. But I want to ask you, Cody. What did what did you see out of Bo Nix? I haven't had a chance to do film study on, on, on the Broncos just yet to see how he assessed the field, how he's playing. I watched him a ton in college, loved it, loved his, his ability to, to throw the ball around the field. How did he look? Did he look like he could be settling in? I saw he had two interceptions. Were those more on him or more about maybe things that were out of his control? Yeah, look, that's the story of the Broncos offense going into this week. And, you know, how can Bo bounce back? And, and look, it's not an easy test against that Steelers defense that we just talked about in the previous segment here. You know, for Bo, his first NFL start in the regular season, uh, we were all, I think, a little surprised at his performance, right? Because I think all throughout training camp, all throughout the preseason, Bo has been consistent, he's been steady, and he's made some impressive plays. He looked like an entirely different player in Sunday's opener against the Seattle. Seattle. And look, obviously, that's a loud environment. That maybe has a factor to play into it, but it was more so what had happened on first and second down that really made it hard for Knicks. And at times there was some mechanical stuff that he's got to get corrected. That what's what Broncos head coach Sean Payton told us earlier here in this week here. Uh, and a lot of it wasn't based on what Seattle was able to do. I, I, I didn't feel like Seattle's pass rush was that great. However, I felt like their linebacker play was disciplined. Their secondary was really good at keeping things in front of them. And then that defense, they forced you to throw it short, and then they rallied and tackled. Well, now this week, you play the Steelers defense. That's going to send pressure after you. They're going to play some zone, but they're going to play a lot of man. They're going to send you know pressure after you to try to get after you. So how how does a young guy like Bo Nix respond? You know, I think being in front of the home crowd will help out a little bit, I think, for him here in this situation. But I think a lot of it is – for him, he pressed a little too much in that week one opener. There were some times where he had some blatant misses. He did have some bad decisions. Both of his interceptions that he threw on Sunday against the Seahawks, they were poor decisions there. And I think it's a learning adjustment for him saying, wow, okay, hey, the speed in the regular season is a lot different than what you're going to get in the preseason. And I think it's going to allow him to adjust. I will say this about Bo, from what I've seen from him just covering him in person, is that 
He learns from his mistakes quickly. Usually he doesn't make the same mistake twice. And of course, he's going to be critical on himself. He went through and he was taking a look at the film this week with Davis Webb and obviously with Sean Payton. I think they're going to try to come out and establish a game plan that's going to put him and everybody else around him on offense in a position to succeed. But the challenge is you have the great equalizer in TJ Watt. You have Alex Highsmith. You have Patrick Queen at that second level, Mika Fitzpatrick, Joey Porter Jr. Pittsburgh has pieces that are going to make things very difficult, I think, for Denver to achieve the things that they want to this season. And look, on top of that, the run game didn't get going for Sean Payton and this Broncos offense on Sunday. Javante Williams' first carry was a nine-yard explosive springy run, and all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, hey, that's a promising sign. The next play, he slips and loses one yard. And then from that point, Denver's running backs, you take away Bo Nix's rushing totals in terms of him scrambling and running. Denver finishes with 63, 64 total yards on the ground between Javante Williams, Jalen McLaughlin, and Audrick Estime. And really, the game plan this week, in my opinion, was, hey, Denver's offense has to come out. They have to find a way to establish the run, which is tough against the Steelers' defense. But now Audrick Estime, the rookie running back, He's out for four weeks. He was placed on injured reserve with an ankle injury, and now your active roster features Javante Williams, Jaleel McLaughlin, Blake Watson. They may elevate Tyler Beatty from the practice squad as a game day elevation this upcoming week. That way they just have you know a multitude of backs. But the concern here is that, hey, okay, how do you get the run game going against this tough defense? Now you're losing one of your big, bruising physical style of backs that could help you in short yarded situations. And on top of that, Chris, you mentioned injuries on the Steelers offensive line. Denver's offensive line has injuries right now as well. Garrett Bowles, an ankle injury, did not participate in Wednesday's practice. We'll see his status going to Thursday and Friday. And then center Luke Wattenberg, we didn't expect that. He popped up on the injury report on Wednesday mm -hmm. as a DNP for an ankle injury. So that means if he can't go, you're going to see Alex Forsyth at center. If Garrett Bowles can't go, you're going to see Matt Parrott, who's looked very shaky at left tackle this season. And if that's the case, if I'm Mike Thomas saying, hey, TJ, go to number 79 side, move around a little bit, and that, that would be nightmare fuel, I think, for the Broncos offense in that situation. And then on top of that, Josh Reynolds and Devon Vele, two players on the offense, a wide receiver who had pivotal roles here in week one. Both guys missed practice on Wednesday. Josh Reynolds with an Achilles, and then obviously Devon Vele with a rib injury. It just right now on paper, it's not looking good for Denver in terms of trying to get the right personnel in line to try to bounce back at home, especially against a, a, a tough Steelers defense that's going to pose a lot of challenges to them here this upcoming Sunday. That, that's where I was going to go next with my question. So you kind of covered already was the run game, because to me, I look at you, I covered Javante Williams in the ACC. I, I've seen him. I've seen his abilities. And I know that when he's healthy, he can he can be dangerous. And when you have that assortment of running backs that you have with the Broncos, if you can build that, you can make life easier for Bo Nix. And that's why the Steelers are, are, prior, are going to prioritize taking away that run. So you talking about the, those issues on the offensive line and now also the issues at running back that that is certainly going to be a big part of the storyline uh, for this for this team as far as how they're going to have to take on the Steelers defense because the Steelers want to take the take away the run they want to force you like uh, to to be to have to beat them through the air but in predictable situations so uh, that's where I think they could be there but let, let's flip to the defense real quick you know the Steelers have T.J. Watt but the Broncos got Pat Sertan and. I, I for my money, he I think he's the best corner in the NFL. I think he's fantastic. I think he, he does a lot of a lot of things the right way. Uh, Mike Tomlin praised him a lot in his Tuesday press conference. Um, what around this defense do you do you feel ha has been developing around Sertan that could help the Broncos kind of contain things moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question there. And look, obviously, Pat Sertan got the bag, $96 million, did a great job against DK Metcalf this past week, had a great pass breakup on a back shoulder throw, only gave up three catches for 29 yards, covered him on 25 total coverage snaps out of 26 this past weekend. So, that I mean, that's a great sign there for him. You know, I think around him, too, this year, what you're going to see, it's a little bit different than last year, Chris, is that Denver defensively, they revamped that defensive line there. They traded for John Franklin Myers during the NFL draft, which is like you look at the Jets situation, you're like, wow, they actually gave up JFM because they were going to get Hassan Reddick, and Hassan Reddick hasn't even reported yet. Yeah. So that's highway robbery here. For the Broncos, JFM has been a tremendous addition at defensive end. Then you have DJ Jones moving back to his natural spot as the nose tackle there in Denver's 3-4 scheme. And then Zach Allen playing the other defensive end spot. And now you got Jonathan Cooper and Baron Browning starting at outside linebacker. And, and look, we had a chance to catch up on Wednesday with Jonathan Cooper. His first game of the season against the Seahawks, he had two sacks. 
He's obviously drastically improved. I think his speed rush, his power rush is really effective there. I, ironically enough, last year where Jonathan Cooper really turned it on, Chris, was against the Chicago Bears. Nick Benito strip-sacked Justin Fields. Jonathan Cooper scooped and scored. That touchdown was what helped the Broncos tie the game up at 28-28 and obviously led to them eventually kick at a game-winning field goal uh, after that a couple of drives later. So uh, just the way that he's got some familiarity and that they know how to play against a guy like Justin Fields, they obviously have come out and they've mentioned that you have to respect his ability to run. The key for them is going to be to try to run the football here. But I would say the other additions, too, is that, you know, Denver's got some questions in the secondary opposite of Pat, like Riley Moss. He's starting at cornerback. And look, there's a running joke that, okay, hey, why, Riley's one of the only white cornerbacks in the NFL to start. I Riley did a. Hey, like he's even embracing it. He's running with it. And there was a, a meme that got passed around, um, you know, from a, you know, famous movie there off to share it there on, on social media. But uh, the thing about Riley is, is he, he had a really good coverage against Tyler Lockett this past week. Now, while Lockett made catches and, and moved the chains on third down, had a couple of back shoulder throws, Riley's coverage was sticky. Riley's, you know, not a lot of guys are getting separation against Riley and, and Lockett never really even got separation from him either. He made tough contested catches. And so now I think you look at this wide receiving core here for the Steelers. I imagine PS2 is going to be on George Pickens quite a bit. I think George Pickens, I'm not sure if he was saying something like, you know, some friendly jong, you know, earlier, I think on Wednesday following practice a little bit about it. I don't think Pastor Tan is going to bite into that as well. He's not really big into responding any bulletin board material, but I think you're going to see Riley Moss against Van Jefferson. I, I know Calvin Austin's a speedy threat there. If I'm not mistaken, I also saw that Roman Wilson, I think, returned to practice on Wednesday mm -hmm. as well. So I, I look at the Steelers receiving weapons. They have talent. They have young guys, as you mentioned. Pat Fryermuth is probably the one guy that probably scares me the most this week from a Denver defensive perspective in comparison to anybody else because they do have a guy like PS2 who can take away, I think, what Pickens can do. I think that'll be a fun battle, but Fryermuth, I think, is the guy who could take advantage. And obviously, Jalen Warren out of the backfield is a guy who worries me because the Broncos gave up a, you know, a passing touchdown to a tailback last week on a busted coverage to Zach Charbonnet. Jalen Warren's the one guy that scares me in this game. I hear you on that one because Jalen Warren scares a lot of people with 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 his with his speed. He uh, him and Donji Harris as a duo, and now also even Cordero Patterson making them a trio. That's gonna be interesting. But I will say Jalen Jalen Warren had a hamstring injury. It had been limit, limiting him. Uh, that had been something the Steelers have been keeping a close close eye on. So uh, that that that's the thing. But not on the injury report this week. So maybe he's a hundred percent and ready to go. Uh, but. Cody, let's get to some of our keys of the game. We're going to do that in the next segment where the Steelers are going to try and find some key because they have not won in Denver since 2009. I was in college that back then. So we'll get to those keys right after this here on Crossover Thursday on the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode of the show is brought to you by our friends over there at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And we talk a lot about FanDuel. We talk a lot about the big games that you can get involved on the action with. I'm going to tell you how you can get involved with the NFL this upcoming season through FanDuel specifically. You can place a $5 bet on FanDuel, if you, and all customers can do this. And you can receive a three-week free trial to NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube and YouTube TV. But this is only valid from now through September 22nd. So if you go on in any game and you place a $5 bet, you will get a three-week free trial to NFL Sunday Ticket through YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game from the comfort of your home. Whether you're near, whether you're far, NFL Sunday Ticket, they have you covered. And all you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com to download America's number one sportsbook and check out your favorite NFL games. Crossover Thursday is presented by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL to win $50 instantly when you play $5. We continue on our crossover Thursday here, getting into what needs to happen in order for the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Denver Broncos to win Sunday's week two matchup. What better way to get the analysis and the local experts on the biggest stories since the Steelers are the away team? They're traveling to Denver. We're going to start things off here with Chris Carter. Chris, when you look at this Steelers team, offensively, defensively, all the storylines that we have talked about, what are three things that the Steelers have to do and how are they going to do it if they're going to leave Empower Field for the first win since 2009? That's the thing. It, it, you know, they're going to have to do it their way. I think that the Steelers are in a position where they know their traditional way 
of playing football the way they've done the last three years since Ben Roethlisberger's been out the league, that is a way that they can that they can go about go about playing. They did it last week against the Falcons. I think they're going to try to do the same exact thing in this game. So my first key is playing playing the way to limit Bo Nix from getting anything started. Don't give him anything easy, any big plays, no busted coverages deep. Your job this week is to make him, if he's going to score on you, he's going to dink and dunk all his way around the field and have to have to hit, hit you with a, with a lot of small shots here and there to force him to have to make 10, 12 really good decisions before he gets a touchdown. And if he does that, kudos to him. But like you were talking about, the Steelers' pass rush, their secondary has been has been really good. Their their linebackers have been more involved in coverage this year. You give yourselves more chances to create a turnover when you force him to have to be like that as a rookie, especially when he was still trying to figure things out last week. Don't let him get his confidence. That's 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 step number one. Step number two. I really think a lot of this comes comes down to can the Steelers offense just do what it did last week and stay ahead of the sticks. I know they didn't get a touchdown and everyone saw, wow, six field goals. They're not going to win too many games like that. But I think that they'll eventually start to finish drives. But the big thing that I saw last week, Cody, was they were able to possess the football. They are now they're in week one. They were fourth in time of possession. They were they were twentieth last year or something like that. And that was a complete turnaround after Matt Canada got fired. And so what you're talking about, Arthur Smith and the differences there. There's one there. They're possessing the football. That means. Justin Fields has to win third downs. They got to give Justin Fields third and shorts, third and five or less uh, to, to allow him, them to have the threat of running the ball as well as passing the ball. Um, and I think that'll be a big key there. But my, my, my last key here is all is also back on the defense. You let no run game emerge. You were talking about the struggles with Javante, with Javante Williams and the offensive line there. You cannot let this be a day where all of a sudden they crack open a, a few big plays and it makes life easier in Bo Nix. Make the rookie quarterback have to live in third and eight, third and nine, third and seven, or longer, anywhere from, from, from there on back, and force him to have to stand back in the pocket, wait for his routes to develop because they're further down the field, and attack and give T.J. Watt, Alex Highsmith, Cam Hayward, you name that Steelers defensive uh, rush pass rusher, give them maybe a four or five second chance to go in and get the quarterback and fluster the rookie. Those are my three keys. Cody, what are you looking at? Oh, I tell you, that's a tough task here. You know, you naming what the Steelers have to do. I look at it from the Broncos' perspective. I'm like, if the Steelers do that, it's going to be a very, very difficult game for the Broncos. And I think the the overall perspective, a lot of people, a lot of the fans don't have a lot of uh, belief this week in the offense, especially because they're playing that Steelers defense. And that, you know, I think the first thing to it, it's kind of a counter to one of your keys. First key here for the Broncos offensively, you have to find a way to run the ball. Look, I think yes. if you have a close game early on, or let's say you have, a tie game. Let's say this is a field goal game, kind of how it was a little bit last week, except Denver had a couple of safeties that, you know, they're able to get some points off of. Don't don't abandon the run game. I, I think so much of it is Denver put themselves in situations where they were passing short on first down or they were throwing behind the sticks on first down. And then the Seahawks defense did a great job of rallying and tackling. Okay, now you face a second and 12, second and 11. Well, okay, you don't you, you can't get anything there. Now you're facing a third and nine. Well, everyone knows you're going to throw the ball now. Denver had too many one-sided plays go against them in terms of negative production or even one to two yards there. If you can get the run game going, you allow Bo to not have the pressure on his shoulders to say, okay, I've got to press here to try to make a play happen. I think that's what he did a little bit too much in week one. And ultimately, it cost the Broncos, I think, a victory. And it cost Bo a, you know, a good performance that he could have had against the Seahawks last week. And the Steelers' defense, as, as Sean Payton has said all week long, he said, no disrespect to Seattle. This defense we're facing this week is a more experienced unit. These guys have been playing together, and they certainly have a scheme that's going to try to dictate the outcome of the game. So I'm very curious to see how Sean Payton counteracts. He can't do it without trying to get the run game going. We'll see if they stick to that, or we'll see if they abandon it early on. If Denver finds themselves down, you know, two possessions, they will more than likely abandon the run game. So Denver can't find themselves in that situation. That'll be key number one. Key number two here, limit the explosives given up. Now, while the Broncos lost this game to Seattle 26 to 20, there were really two plays that defined the outcome of it against Denver's defense. Now, in the third quarter, the, the Seahawks went a little bit up-tempo. They gashed him in a no-huddle approach, and then Kenneth Walker had a 23-yard touchdown. Okay, that's an explosive play you give up. There's that. Geno Smith, earlier in the game, had a 34-yard touchdown run because Denver sent an all-out pressure. It was beautifully sent, beautifully timed, but then there was one guy just off by half a yard. Geno Smith took it, and he ran for 34 yards. Justin Fields is a lot faster than Geno Smith. So 
So you can't have those type of breakdowns where Fields can step up in between, you know, in the pocket when it kind of creates a little bit of an opening. He can get to the second level and take it. We've seen Fields rush for over 100 yards from a quarterback standpoint in Chicago. You don't think he can't do it with the Pittsburgh Steelers. That will be a challenge. And also just accounting for the tailbacks, another explosive. Zach Charbonnet wide open on a running back wheel route. Seemed like a miscommunication defensively, but limit the explosives here by the Steelers offense who do have some explosive players, albeit that they are young, but they still have the capability of breaking off a big play and that could suck the wind out of your sails early on. That is key number two. The third and final key here, Bo Nix. He has to play better and the offense needs to be ahead of the sticks in a lot of the situations. You couldn't ask for a tougher test for Bo Nix than this Steelers defense because how often is it that you're going to find yourself ahead of the sticks when you're facing that vaunted pass rush there? And if, look, not a lot of people, I think, talk about Alex Highsmith enough. He's evolved over the last couple of years to be a very, very good pass rusher opposite of Watt there. And you mentioned a fully healthy Cam Hayward. This is a tough challenge. And look, if Bo can play better, if he can rise to the occasion, it's going to change a lot of the opinions that fans had on him following week one. It doesn't get any better than the opportunity and the challenge of the Steelers' defense, but at the same time, it could also dig in a little bit of a deeper hole. So Bo, for the third and final key, he has to play better, and the offensive unit around him has to help him out in some way, shape, or form. I think there's a lot of similarities between how these teams need to win this football game. I think it's what happens when you got young quarterbacks that you're trying to protect, young offensive lines or offensive lines that you're trying to that you're trying to still put together. Um, I, I do think this could come down to those explosive plays. It would which team can get some of those uh, to make life easier for their offense, uh, and that could be. I think that's going to be a, maybe the story of the game is if if Bo Nix gets that. It changes everything, and it gives them a chance. It, it you know it, it gives them a chance to put the Steelers' offense in the des in desperation mode. But that might be the the ultimate key here is Cody get one of these offenses into desperation mode. If, if one of these teams get a, gets gets a a fourteen point lead at some point in this game, the other is going to be pressed to step Ooh. outside of itself and do things that could be dangerous and lead to even more mistakes. Yeah, 100%. And look, in this game, I know the lines have moved a little bit. Initially, the Steelers were three-point uh, road favorites against Denver. That line has now shifted to our friends over there at FanDuel Sportsbook uh, to two-and-a-half uh, road favorites here against the Broncos, where the over-under is set at 36-and-a-half, where it feels like the under might be very appeasing in this game here. We'll see how it all goes. But look, a lot of things, a lot of storylines we'll continue to monitor. And look, Broncos country, you want to know the ladies and what's going on with the injury status of some of those players that Chris had mentioned. Well, make sure you check out Locked on Steelers throughout the week here to get some inside intel from Chris on Locked on Steelers. And if you want to get some more updates on the Broncos side of things, we'll have you covered here on Locked on Broncos. But thank you so much to everyone who's in Steelers Nation or Broncos country for making us your first listen here, wherever you get your podcasts or available on YouTube. We always love Crossover Thursdays brought to you by friends over there at Price Picks. Make sure you use lowercase code locked on NFL to get involved here today. Chris, as always, appreciate chatting with you. Big game on Sunday for both of these teams inside the AFC. And even though it's early on in the season, these types of games are always high stakes because it could factor into tiebreakers at the end of the year. For all the respective fan bases, we'll have you covered on our shows on tomorrow's episode, Locked on Broncos and Locked on Steelers.